Good morning, everyone. The May 12, 2022 virtual meeting of the Anne Arundel County Council is now in session. Today, we will hear from a handful of departments regarding the proposed FY23 budget. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Lacey. Present. Ms. Pickard. Present. Mr. Volke. Present. Mr. Pruski. Here. Ms. Fiedler. I know Ms. Fiedler's on her way. She's not quite here yet. Ms. Radvian. Present. Ms. Hare. Present. Ms. Bolayer. Present. Madam Chair, we have six council members currently in attendance and our county auditor. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, please pause for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, will be, which will be led by Ms. Hare today. Let us be thankful for this day that we have been given, for its blessings, its opportunities, its challenges. May we appreciate and use each day that comes to us to the best of our abilities through collaboration and kindness. Let us seek strength and guidance for each day's duties and be challenged to give our best always. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read the Open Meetings Act statement. Yes, Madam Chair, I do wanna note that Ms. Fiedler is here. She's uh, in attendance at this moment. Wonderful, thank you. The Maryland Open Meetings Act is a state law that requires public meetings to be open to the public and to be held in places reasonably accessible to individuals who would like to attend these meetings. While a virtual meeting of this type was not envisioned by the Open Meetings Act, steps have been taken to ensure that this virtual meeting includes alternate accessibility features that the Open Meetings Act Compliance Board and the courts have once reviewed and approved, such as having a call-in phone number that allows anyone with a telephone to call and listen to the meeting, broadcasting the meeting with video and audio on cable TV and the web, and allowing the public to register and watch the meeting in Zoom. The public access provided by this technology makes this virtual meeting reasonably accessible to the public as required by the Open Meetings Act. Thank you very much. Is there any item any council member would like to place on the agenda? All right, hearing none, we will begin today's budget presentations. Department presenting will be finance. All presenters, please remember to introduce yourself and continue to identify yourself before speaking each time. Um, from finance, we have Karen McQuaid, our, our county controller, Billy Penley, Jessica Papalianti, Michael Beard, and Darlene Flynn. And you may begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chair Rod Vian, Vice Chair Pruski, Council Members, and Madam Auditor. I am Karen McQuaid, Controller, Office of Finance. You've already introduced my team. So the Office of Finance can be found in the budget book on pages 126 through 132. In my handout, I included a summary on the Office of Finance. I believe most of you have read um, read this summary, so I won't go into any detail. I believe the most important things to note about the Office of Finance and the finance team is that we're a service organization, both to internal and external customers, and that many of our team interact directly with the citizens and property owners in the county. We also assist in getting those in need to help to the right resources through our website information, assistance and guidance on the phone, referring those in need to aging, social services, ACADS, and any one else that we believe can help. We work with veterans, public safety officers, and citizens to receive tax credits authorized by the county code and direct them to the proper resources at the state when assistance is needed. Our team is also directly involved in tracking and reporting of ARPA funding, including monthly reporting you've been receiving and meeting treasury reporting requirements, which is no small task. The Office of Finance has 76 positions in the county classified service. One of these is part-time and two exempt positions. In addition to these eight, 78 positions, we have one part-time staff in recordation and transfer tax and four, five part-time temporary staff that are retirees that assist us in completing tasks, such as municipal IT support and changes. Two are retirees from customer service that fill in two or three days a week to assist on the phone. So we have continuous coverage during vac 
breaks, vacations, illness, and assisting with training. I believe our staff is pretty lean and we do our best to assist, um, absorb new work, make process improvements to streamline work where possible, and our team always assists each other when needed. I've also provided a summary of our major accounts in FY23 budgeted amounts in the Office of Finance. I believe this is helpful because other than payroll, these are our biggest expense areas. So now let me go over the budget. In summary, the Office of Finance proposed budget for fiscal 23 is $11.3 million or 11%, an 11% or $1.1 million increase over the FY22 budget. In breaking down our fiscal 23 budget, approximately 73.3% is budgeted for personal services, including salaries, wages, pension, insurance, and employer taxes. Contractual service accounts for approximately 24% of our FY23 budget, consisting of ambulance fee services, our financial audits, other professional fees, and legal notices. The significant increase is due to the new GEMT ambulance program, which I will discuss. 6.1% is for general off supplies, printing and mailings, which are mainly our utility bills and notices. The remainder of business and travel, including membership fees, training at less than 1%. The major variants to the FY22 budget are as follows. The increase of $403,000 or 5.1% in personal services can be attributed to countywide increases to the pay package and benefits for fiscal 23, along with some additional contract help. In contractual services, we show a $673,000 or 40.9% increase. In accounting control, contractual services it includes financial audit services. This includes fees for financial services, including investment and banking software, m and custody fees in the amount of $255,000. This increased $29,000 or approximately 8% due to increased services, pricing, and reporting needs. Other professional services includes ambulance fees and lockbox fees for the long-term county program in the amount of $540,000 and $8,000 respectively. The county is charged 4.25% of revenues. The revenues are shown in the fire department and the expenses in finance. If revenues increase or decrease, the fees that follow the same at 4.25%. In addition, a new agreement was signed last year with ADP, our current ambulance fee coordinator. The county pays fees at 10% of revenues received from Medicaid through the GMT or Ground Emergency Medical Transportation Program. While we budgeted $3 million of revenues and 300,000 in fees for FY22, revenues were significantly higher at 6.6 .6 million for the nine month program. For FY23, we're estimating about $8.9 million in revenue for 12 months or 886,000 in fees. This accounts for 596,000 of the $673,000 variance from the FY22 budget. In addition, we have $50,000 for professional consulting service for GASB implementations. Data processing hardware is budgeted for 80,000 for the GASB 87 lease and investment software um, accounting for addition, the additional variance. Supplies and materials increased $52,000 and 8.2% increase. The main spend beyond normal supply needs for the printing is for the printing of county envelopes and tax flyers for a budget of $55,000 and mailing of our tax and water and wastewater bills at $555,000 or a 9.9% increase over FY22 budget due to increases in mailings and postage rates, which are also expected to increase another 7% in July on July 1st, 22. The Office of Finance continues to strive for excellence in the reporting service to the county and constituents. Thank you for your time and consideration of the Office of Finance proposed budget. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from my colleagues? Well, seeing none, um, um, I appreciate the detail and the focus on the, the changes for the FY23 budget. Um, so I guess if we come up with any questions, we will be in touch. We know where to find you. Thank you Great. very much. And thank you to your team. Thank you. All right. Um, our next department today will be the Office of Emergency Management. And our presenters are Preeti Emrick our Director of Emergency Management, Joseph Corona, and Hannah Dyer. And I believe that um, Ms. Emmerich may have some additional, um, additional team members on for the presentation today. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Council. My name is Preeti Emmerich, Director of the Office of Emergency Management. 
With me is my deputy director, Joseph Corona. Um, and I do have um, other personnel in probably the waiting room at this point available to answer questions. I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I would like to share, if possible. Uh, Priya, I will bring that up. There's two. Is the operating one the first one that you would like? Yes. To have on? Okay. All right. Give me yes. One so one. we'll be going through the operating budget for the Office of Emergency Management first. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, again, Office of Emergency Management, and I just wanna take you through a few things of what we have done this year, and obviously talk about our FY23 initiatives. As you can see, we have had a busy year. Um, many of you have been involved in some of these events that have led to this busy year. But what I wanted to point out is that we got two mayor positions last year, and that has helped us tremendously, not only to build our staff, to be able to respond to the needs of the communities and help them recover some, from such events. We've had special events such as the inauguration and the Blue Angels and Commissioning Week. We've been helping public safety coordinate on special events, especially on the fairgrounds. Um, but there's the unexpected that has happened. The cyber attack on Colonial Pipeline, the Clipper K condo fire, which happened last August and that we're still trying to respond and recover from. And of course, Mother Nature has uh, thrown us for a few loops with tornadoes, hurricanes, coastal flooding, and a severe winter storm. And these are all things that the Office of Emergency Management has been involved in. And of course, the biggest event in recent years, COVID-19, still ongoing, and we're still coordinating efforts among the county agencies and our partnerships in order to meet the needs of the community. And one thing that I wanted to point out is through all these events, we have helped the county agencies become better prepared and better trained. Through our new exercise and training programs, um, we have seen um, training and exercises increase so that our emergency operations center reps, representation from various agencies, the trainings have increased from 28% to 40%. That means our county agencies are better equipped and better trained in order to help the county respond and recover um, um, from events. Next slide. So we talk about county agencies being better prepared to respond to help the community recover. But what we need to focus on in the Office of Emergency Management is actually helping the public and the community themselves be better prepared and to better respond and recover. Um, emergency preparedness, we talk about the whole community concept. It, in, it involves everybody from not only county agencies, but our partnerships with nonprofits, but also personal preparedness. And so we've really taken the approach that different populations and different communities respond in different ways, they recover in different ways, they can be prepared in different ways. And the Office of Emergency Management is really leaning forward and how we can help different populations in different communities be better prepared and to better respond and recover. So some of the initiatives we have taken on is reaching out to students, um, not only a snow day at the Office of Emergency Management, hosting the youth on how to be better prepared and what actually goes on in winter storms. We had fire and police present as well. Um, we had an essay writing contest um, for the signature programs on some of the high schools. And um, part of the prize was, you know, <clears throat> having a day at um, the Office of Emergency Management and seeing exactly what we do. We're also trying to do outreach to our younger community because preparedness starts at a very young age. And so we've developed Pepper the Preparedness Pup. I am sure you've seen her videos, coloring pages, and soon to come magnets and stickers on how to best prepare youth um, to be prepared for any emergency, any incident that may come. We've also leaned into um, um, communities where English may not be the primary language and to make sure that our materials and our presentations are focused and are understood by everybody in the community. And again, we have increased our outreach to um, certain organizations such as Annapolis Pride, having our preparedness game to be more community focused. And one of the things we've recently really been involved in is a coordination on um, helping the Afghan refugees who were in um, the BWI area 
obviously with their resources, their needs, but also in their long-term recovery and resettlement. And emergency management, I know traditionally has been thought of as, well, let's respond to the hurricane because this is important. Let's respond to the tornadoes, yes. But the collaboration and coordination skills that we have can be applied to any area really um, in, in terms of an incident or a crisis. And we've been leaning forward this year in order to help the county prepare, respond, and recover from whatever type of incident, larger scale incident that might happen. Next slide, please. So some of the FY23 project initiatives builds forward on that, helping the community prepare, respond, and recover. One of the um, new positions that we are hoping um, to have is a communications and outreach person. Um, what we have discovered is that while we have done outreach, there wasn't an overall strategy on how to best approach certain populations, certain communities. And especially when there is an incident, having a public information officer that really understands what we do and knows the important information to convey to the public is key. So some of the responsibilities, as you can see, includes that communications and outreach strategy because we have to build the relationships with the communities before disaster starts. Day-to-day, -day, again, includes supervising those outreach um, efforts, drafting the press releases, maintaining those media relationships. The Office of Emergency Management wants to have more of a presence in communities, and this position will help us do that. The second initiative is the Funds for Rapid Relief Response. I've highlighted some of the, um, the um, incidents that we're still recovering from, right? Whether it's um, the Clipper K um, condo fire, which has taken a long time of recovery from, but also the smaller incidents. What we have found is even with fires, um, the traditionally re relied upon organizations and resources may not be there in time for that immediate essentials that survivors need. And having these funds for rapid relief gives the county the flexibility um, for us to assist the victims, the survivors of an incident, whether it's a small fire or whether it's something larger where we can provide those immediate reliefs. And this has the support of several other county departments and agencies. Uh, when working with the fire department, crisis response, we have found that having that zero to two hour immediate response and relief is key in order to, in order to help the community members, at least in those immediate needs and resources to help them recover. That's not to say organizations like the Red Cross or others aren't as important, but they do come in in the longer term recovery. So having this flexibility will greatly enhance how we provide our services to the community. Next slide, please. I was told to keep it short, so I hope I kept it short. Um, and please, for the operating budget, if you have any questions, I see one question, but I'll. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Volke, you may have the floor. Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Emmerich, thank you for your presentation and being here this morning. Um, did have a question for you. So looking specifically at the line item of business and travel, it looks like in FY21, I'm assuming that was sort of a low year because of the situation, how the world was going at 51,000. But I went back historically to look at OEM's budget. I looked at the FY20 budget and looking at that, even there, um, it looks like it was about 72,900 was what was spent in FY 2019. But what I'm seeing your FY22 estimate is 224,000. So I think my first question is, are you all basically on track to double your business and travel budget this this year and this fiscal year from what was budgeted to what you've actually expended? So in terms of business and travel, and I think this goes back to how we have our operating expenses. Sorry, Pretty Emmerich, Director of Office of Emergency Management. Um, <clears throat> in the past, we have had grant money. We've been heavily relying on grant money to do traveling and lodging and expenses. But what we have found is that the grant money has limited us in what we could do. Um, and in terms of the Office of Eman Emergency Management being more involved in other areas that may not be covered in grant, we have found that in order to attend conferences such as MACO, that's not even covered <laughs> by our grant money. 
just because of the criteria of the grant, we had to increase that line item budget. And I also will, um, if Hannah, our budget analyst, has anything to add to that. Sure, Hannah Dyer from the budget office. Another thing that Preeti mentioned earlier is that the Office of Emergency Management has kind of grown recently in the number of positions that they have um, because of the profile that emergency management is kind of the higher profile that emergency management is taking on kind of nationally, not just here in Anne Arundel County. So with a larger staff size, we would expect some of those other expenses to also increase. And I missed some of the numbers that you read off, but just uh, to make sure we're looking at the same numbers in terms of general funds for business and travel. In FY21, they spent about 10,000 and the budget in general funds is about 17,000. Can I ask a quick follow-up, Madam Chair? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I guess just so that I understand directly on the question, on budget page 294 that I'm looking at, it says that the estimate for FY22 is 224,000. And next to that, it says the original FY 2022 was 113,000. So I think the question I'd ask and, and where I wanna make sure I understand is, is that saying that OEM has spent $111,000 more than was budgeted in FY22? So it's not necessary, Hannah Dyer from the budget office, it's not um, necessarily that they've spent it, but they expect their, their estimate at this point in time for the current year is that they will spend higher than the amount budgeted. Um, and I just to clarify again, a lot of that is grant funding, not general funds. So there's a OEM in particular has a lot of different grant sources that they get throughout the year and those can change throughout the year. There may be new grants that come in that they didn't expect at the beginning of the year. So that's primarily related to their grant funding. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, I asked kind of a similar question to, I think it was the Office of Planning and Zoning yesterday about their business and travel. And I'm wondering if maybe what I had asked them might be the easiest thing for you all to, would it be possible to just get a list of kind of what business and travel you've got included in here? Is it MAKO? Is it something else? For how many people and whether it's grant money or general fund money? Um, go ahead, Hannah, if you wanna go first. Yeah, Hannah Dyer from the budget office. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yes, we the yeah. budget office and OEM will put that together. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. Thank you, Ms. Emmerich, for that presentation and Ms. Dyer for being here to answer our questions. I'm going to piggyback on the uh, previous questions, uh, grant funding versus general fund mm -hmm. uh, funding. Are you all anticipating, we've heard this term used in um, other departments, um, anticipating some sort of cliff when the grant funding is no longer in the budget, or is this something that doesn't apply to your department? Pretty Emmerich, Office of Emergency Management. Um, it is a gamble each year on how much grant money we get. Um, do I anticipate a, um, I guess, as you call a cliff where there is no grant funding at all? No, but our office is um, at the mercy of what the federal government decides and the levels of funding that fluctuate every year. Hannah Dyer from the Budget Office. Um, I assume this is this question is related mostly to the pandemic related grant funding. Okay. Um, and so I, I believe OEM already, some of those grant funds that OEM has received, some of them have already stopped coming to the county or will kind of stop in fiscal 23. Um, so I, I don't think I would say that we've seen a, a cliff with that specific funding. <coughs> Again, OEM, about two thirds of their budget is made up of grant funding each year. So like Preeti said, there's a lot of movement with their grant funds generally. Uh, 
All right, I don't see any other hands. So I will say um, thank you very much um, for this part of your presentation. And at this time, I think we are ready to move on to the capital part of the budget and talk about the new 911 center. Um, yes, thank you. Again, Preeti Emmerich, Office of Emergency Management, and you may see a lot of other Preeti Emmerichs on the screen. I assure you, I have not cloned myself, um, but this is an important topic that um, fire and police also uh, uh, strongly believe in, so they have joined me on the call, and I can't see them, so I just want to reassure you their names are not Preeti Emmerich. <laughs> so I will continue to move forward with the presentation. Again, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the council, this is in relation to the capital improvement project of the Joint 911 Communications and Emergency Operation Center proposal. Next slide, please. I know there's been a lot of talk about the 911 center and especially in the news recently, so I don't need to rehash that. But here are a key few uh, factors that I wanna hone in on. This remains the only 911 center in Maryland that requires transfer of fire and medical to a secondary 911 center. Again, that transfer reduces the effectiveness of a unified public safety communication. Fire, police, different buildings. Um, anytime there is an incident that requires both, it, it takes up two call takers. The situational awareness is not there as if you had one call taker being able to take the call and triage it appro appropriately. Um, <clears throat> the primary 911 center in police is outdated. There is a lack of space. Um, and again, that's going back to remaining the only 911 center in Maryland is not aligned with current and national standards. Next slide, please. So with the inspection of the current 911 structure, I just wanna point out one report and a letter that we had received from the 911 board. So during the September 2019 Emergency Number Systems Board inspection of the county's 911 center, this just emphasizes the point that I know has been talked about for many years, that the operational space of the 911 call center have outgrown its capacity and its needs, but also that we have this um, 911 call taking that's handled in both police and fire headquarters, which may not be the most efficient way of providing 911 service. In a follow-up letter we had from the 911 board, again, they reemphasize the point that transferring 911 calls creates not only a delay, but risks that the caller disconnects during the transfer. The board encourages, and they have been encouraging for years, the county to consolidate the call, sending, call taking operations to one agency. Next slide, please. So in another study that was done in terms of the next gen 911 that is coming in um, about 18 months to Anne Arundel County, which for the community, it's a bonus, right? It encourages multimedia ways of connecting with 911 and reporting any emergencies. Um, they have found that even now, that nine 911 call takers should be available during the busiest hours of the day to answer incoming calls. And as we know, with the um, staffing shortages that the 911 center faces, we're not there at that um, optimal level of staffing. We're at a safe level of staffing, but not that ultimate level, optimal, optimal level, excuse me. And this study was focused mainly on the primary 911 center, which is police. It didn't even take into account to fire and the fact that EMS and fire calls take much longer because when you're trying to walk somebody through CPR or life, medical saving calls that takes much longer. And with EMS and fire tied up, that makes the transfers even more difficult. Next slide, please. So this is our proposal of consolidating the 911 center under the Office of Emergency Management, which would become a larger organization of Department of Emergency Management and Communications. And what we stress is again, that coordination among the public safety agencies. So having the two divisions, one emergency management that talks about planning response recovery, and then having that emergency communications, which will still involve police EMS personnel, of course, to oversee, to manage, because they're the experts, but having that first point of contact 
with a single call taker in order to triage what might not might be necessary and having that situational awareness for incidents for larger scale incidents with the office of emergency management and especially with the larger scale incident where police fire and OEM have to talk to each other is a bonus for the county right we talk about in other counties public safety centers and that has really that coordination and that situational awareness will only enhance how we respond to incidents and how we recover to incidents. And again, the communication between the public safety agencies is key. And having 911 communications in a consolidated agency with OEM, police, and fire playing a role is very beneficial to the county. Next. <clears throat> So we talk about an emergency operations center. I wanna make this clear that what our, we have in our current facility is also outdated and quite old. And we lack the ability at this point to effectively coordinate with 911 and our unified command. What happens is there's a flurry of a bunch of calls that you know come, go between agencies. And especially with COVID-19, we've been activated a lot and our technology in our space has not been able to support those kind of activations. And again, with our emergency operations center, we're not meeting best current best practices or standards. But what I wanna emphasize about the emergency operations center is that this is gonna be used by many agencies, whether it's police, fire, or the departmental operation command, sheriff's office, et cetera. This is meant as a county operations center for public safety to coordinate, to utilize, to train, to respond, to recover. So I really wanna make sure that we understand this is a smart utilization of a space that will benefit many agencies. Next, our goals and objectives. I'm not gonna read all of this. I have my wonderful PowerPoint presentation. I know you guys can read, but I want to focus on goal number one. This is for the benefit of the community. We wanna decrease response times. We wanna increase quality insurance and having that consolidation will tremendously help in that. And what I've emphasized in previous presentations is that it's not gonna solve everything, I get it. But this is one step in towards making and having better services for the community. Again, enhancing the situational awareness among the county, public safety agencies, that overall efficiency, having a new center, I know will help in that sustained recruiting requirement and that environment. I know many of you have taken a tour of the primary 911 center. We can do better for our 911 dispatchers who are on the front line and have to you know, coordinate and call with our community to make sure that they get services. Next slide, please. This also is one of the goals in Plan 2040. 10.1, ensure appropriate levels of staffing and resources that arrive within accepted response times to all calls for services. This will help. And I wanna emphasize the second point, seek all feasible means of increasing efficiency while addressing budget limitations. Next slide, please. So what I wanna emphasize is that the investment that the county makes, we will also be pursuing other avenues of funding, whether that's by grants, whether it's federal, private, regional, local, state, et cetera. We are committed to making sure that we do this in the most fiscally responsible way. And we're already in the process of applying for grants, not only for phase one, which I'll talk about in the next slide for the consultant, but we already have other grant applications lined up for the different phases and how we can um, fiscally um, decrease the cost to the county. Next slide. So we have the project phases here. Phase one, we need a consultant to help us obviously design the best building, or maybe we have a building in mind already that we can design. Land assessment on what would be the best land for the 911 center. And this is not, we're not the first jurisdiction to do this all around the county, the state, the country, there have been consolidation of 911 centers. So there are consultants out there who can point us in the best direction of how to do this in a fiscally sound manner and to make very smart investment and utilization of space. Phase two is the construction and the continuity of essential functions. Obviously, while this is being done, we have to make sure 911 services 
are continued. And that involves using our backup 911 center and other means in order to ensure those services continue. And then phase three is the implementation. And of course, the introduction of this new 911 emergency operations center. And again, with each phase, we are committed to being fiscally responsible, getting as much grant funding or outside funding as we can um, to limit what the county has to spend. Next slide, please. And again, um, there's still maybe a lot of pretty Emmerichs on the screen, but I want to make sure everybody understand this is much needed for the county. And this is something that public safety is united. And again, as you could tell on the screen, whenever they turn up their pictures, fire and police are supportive of this and are here to answer questions that you might have regarding current operations and what the future operations may look like. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from my colleagues? Uh, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. I don't have a question. I just want to thank um, your staff, Ms. Preeti, and the police department for allowing me to take a second tour kind of more in depth of the 911 call center. Spent about three hours there getting into all the nooks and crannies. And I do understand that there is literally no, no wiggle room. <laughs> so I appreciate the presentation and, and all the work that you're doing to try to move us in this direction. Thank you. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that presentation. Um, it, of course, one of the one of the things that we hear about very quickly is, uh, you know, if somebody says, you know, I was on hold with 911 for whatever period of time, and really, you know, any period of time feels like too long, and generally, can, you know, can be too long given the particular situation. So, I'd like to be able to translate what what um, you would like us to do in this budget directly to constituents to say, this is how soon you can expect call time to go down. This is how soon you can expect, you know, responses to to improve. I think it's, I think we we all have to agree that we we have a lot of improvements to make, but we need to manage some expectations as well. Um, and, you know, and help people understand why it's taking however long it takes. Uh, Pretty Emmerich, Office of Emergency Management. If I'm understanding your question, correctly is maybe how long the project will take in terms of seeing the improvements? Um, I think it's, well, it's to me it's, and I think from what I understood from constituents, it's both operational and the capital project, right? People in need don't think about the separation between those two. They just want their 911 call answered and they want to never be put on hold. Um, Pretty Emmerich, Office of Emergency Management. This is a multi-year project. And in terms of the consolidation and Lieutenant McAndrew, I know if you wanted to jump in in terms of operationally what's happening now versus in the future, um, the coordination will take, it's a multi-year project. Um, so in terms of immediate um, changes, I think there are small, there are things that are being done in terms of trying to hire more staff. Um, but in terms of what you're talking to the constituents, we, what we wanna make sure is that when we do this 911 center, it's not just an immediate fix, which yes, we would all love to have. This is more of the long-term goal, right? This is not just a five-year building. This is a building that we wanna project 50 years from now, right? to make sure that it meets the needs, not only of the constituents, but the technology needs and the ever-changing landscape of 911 call taking and multimedia. So we wanna do this right from the get-go. So there's no cutting corners. There's no, what, what, what can we do to you know, have a quick fix? To do this, we've got to do this right from the get-go. I know um, there are small changes that we're making along the way. Um, but in order to, uh, to, to have the best service for the constituents, we wanna make sure that the project gets right. And that may take some years. But Lieutenant McAndrew, if you wanna add anything to that. 
I do. Uh, John McAndrew from the police department, Lieutenant McAndrew, uh, director of our 911 center for the police department. Uh, Ms. Lacey, I, I understand your question. I, you know, I, I completely do. And I know you want to tell your constituents as soon as we uh, approve this budget, things will improve in the call handling process. It will improve when we're sitting together and there's only one call taker who handles the call and we don't have to transfer. Uh, that could probably take, as Ms. Pre Ms. Emmerich uh, identified, a few years for us to do. In the short term, here's what we're doing at the Police Department 911 Center. And I uh, wanna thank everyone who participated in improving the pay and benefit package and bonuses and those type of things that matter to our call takers and our dispatchers. We are going to hire 13 people, I believe, in two weeks. We're going to train them as quickly as we can, get them on the floor to help us staff our vacancies. We have tremendous vacancies. This next wave of hire, we have three hiring phases. We have one in May, which is coming up. We have one in July, and we have one in September. I'm pleased to announce that we had over a thousand applicants for this position in the last two hiring phases. During COVID and post COVID, I mean, we were under a hundred plus on each phase. So there is, there's tremendous uh, movement forward. It appears that we're gonna get to where we need to be with our staffing. When we, and when, if we could get under you know, 10% vacancy rate, that gives us the opportunity to police department to, in essence, overstaff our 911 center so that we don't have callers go on hold. Right now, we don't have that opportunity. So in the short term, uh, Ms. Lacey, the question is, I do believe things improve in the next six to 12 months in our call handling process. Does that answer your question? It does, and, and also, um, Ms. Emmerich, what uh, you said answers my question too. They, I know there are two pieces. It's just you know wanting to be able to um, communicate reasonable expectations to you know to our taxpayers and our constituents. So, thank you both very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District Seven. Um, I appreciated Councilwoman Lacey's question. Actually, as as you know. Um, with with the 911 call and a constituent on hold earlier this year. So I, I appreciated that question, Councilwoman Lacey, thank you. Um, I was struck by the slide, Ms. Emmerich, that you put up about the study in 2020, um, showing kind of the deficiencies here and that we're the only jurisdiction that doesn't have this joint center. And so I'm curious, I guess, how long have we been the only jurisdiction without a joint center? And, you know, did, did you all ask for this in, previous budgets, you know, where, how come we haven't been doing this yet? Because I'm so excited to see it. I'm, I'm very glad to see it in this year. So I, I don't mean to have that question be, you know, antagonistic. I'm just trying to figure out why it, why I guess it's only in this year's budget instead of previously. Pretty Emmerich, Office of Emergency Management. Um, I don't know, I don't have the institutional knowledge to know how long we've been the only um, center, uh, excuse me, only county like this, maybe Lieutenant McAndrew has that answer. Um, and to answer your second point, I think this has been in discussion for a while before I have come into the office. Um, perhaps um, some of my police and fire colleagues can glean more on the history of uh, kind of the proposals that have been going around. Um, but Lieutenant McAndrew, um, if you know about how, how long we've been the only jurisdiction. I, I do, Ms. Emmerich, and we're probably five to six years uh, has been the last consolidation in the state of Maryland. So we're probably five, a good five years uh, uh, out of where our partners have been. Um, if I want to make a comment to Ms. Emmerich, you know, we're moving into what's called IP-based 911 services in the county across the country, actually. And that's going to eventually change 911 call reception in our call centers. And um, when Ms. Emmerich talked about that 50 year build out, I mean, this is such an important project for the county moving forward on emergency call processing because eventually callers will be able to use their cell phones and text in photographs. 
videos. I mean, that's on the horizon. That horizon's coming rapidly. And we will have to have the capacity of the building, the technology to handle that flow of calls for service, right? You know, cell phones have really changed the game in 911. It, and you see it all across the country. You know, 911 centers are proliferated with calls and with incidents because of cell phones. 20 callers can call. You don't have 20 call takers to process there, right? So, you know, the need is there. Uh, and, and Ms. Emmerich did a phenomenal job describing that need. Uh, and we do need a 50-year build out for, for our call center and for our county government and our citizens. Hope that answers the question. Five it, years, Ms. Harris. It did. Thank you so much. I really appreciate Great. that. Um, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just, for the benefit of institutional knowledge, though I wasn't here, I do remember even prior councils talking about this project. So I think it's been on the horizon for a long time. Um, who knows, Mr. Trumbauer might be able to speak to that because he was on those councils. But I, I know this has been in the work for a long time. I remember the last administration talking about it. But one of the questions that I, I did have, Ms. Emmerich and, and uh, Lieutenant McAndrews, you, you've now said it too, but this 50 year build out, I guess the question that I have with that is, when I was on the library board, we did the facilities master plan and we were looking at where libraries should be and how they should be located. And one of the things that we noticed is that when we built buildings 50 years ago with the intention of them being there for 50 years, what we found out is that not that far into their life cycle, they became a real challenge to upgrade technologically because the changes that were happening were so quick um, and so sort of impactful that you couldn't even really retrofit the building to bring it up to speed. And so one of the things that we talked about when I was on that number of years ago was, should we do more lease space or how should we be building buildings to make sure that they have the greatest ability to be scalable based on future technological changes and needs? So, I mean, I'm not expecting you to have a perfect answer to that right this second, but I definitely am looking at the scope of this project. And that's something I want to make sure is that whatever we're doing, that you will absolutely be able to kind of scale it. And I'm, I'm certain you guys already are looking at it, but that's just something from my past that I thought I would at least mention. Um, so if you can talk to that now, that's great. If not, and, and this is something for future budget cycles, because I know the brunt of the funding is coming next year. Um, I'll look forward to talking about it then. So thank you. Pretty Emmerich Office of Emergency Management. I think that's why it's really important to work with a consultant who has done this before, right? And has an understanding of what, you know, Lieutenant McAndrew and I say 50 year build out to make sure we get an expert who understands the ever changing landscape of 911 um, and how we should best utilize the space and the land, et cetera. So that's why the phase one of the project is dedicated to that, to getting it right. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Alton Pickard, District 2. Um, just as a matter of, of history, this council saw um, our first uh, inkling of a combined 911 center in the public safety placeholder for the <clears throat> permanent public infrastructure funds in the FY20 budget. So We've been we've been aware of this as a need, at least as a sitting council. But I um, and um, I wanted to, but I but I wanted to ask a question about vacancy rates for both police and fire. Um, can we just have a quick conversation about where we are? I was really, I am really happy to hear that we've got applicants coming on board. But can we just get a an update on vacancies and and hiring and things like that? Thank you. Good morning, Tricia Wolford, Fire Chief, Anne Arundel County Fire Department. Uh, we currently have four vacancies. We have three going through the hiring process right now. Uh, and with our most recent vacancy, uh, we are actually running a process to begin a new list. So we've exhausted the existing list. Uh, so we're hoping all three of those make it through training, which would give us one vacancy. I wish we had that kind of news to report at the police department that the chief from Chief Wolfer provided. We have, I'm looking at my chart right now, 34 vacancies. Um, you know, most of those are 28 of those are what we call our dispatchers. They're, they're, they're our radio operators. And we have six 
call take vacancies. This class that we're hiring in May will fill our call take vacancies and we'll start to chip away at our dispatch vacancies. So hopefully in July, we'll get another wave that we'll be able to fill uh, more dispatchers and in September, fill more dispatchers. Um, you know, one of the challenges that uh, we face in the 911 Center is it's about a 10 month training process to become a dispatcher. It's a very demanding job. So uh, that's our report. You know, we're, we're optimistic that uh, things are gonna change. And uh, the I can give you this uh, response back from our call takers and dispatchers. They are very, very uh, optimistic and are looking forward to the opportunity to work in a consolidated call center and believe it's a change for them, a change for the good. It moves them forward to have opportunities, career development opportunities, advancement opportunities that they kind of don't have today. So I wanted you to hear that. But yes, our vacancy rate is high. Madam Chair, can I just ask a follow-up real quick? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. So are, are those um, um, vacancy numbers for dispatchers and call takers, is that a new phenomenon or is that something uh, that we've been struggling with for, you know, a, a few years or just is this COVID related vacancy issues or job labor market? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I uh, certainly don't have a background in that, Ms. Pickard, but uh, I've been in the assignment for six and a half years and I've seen us ride a roller coaster, right? I've seen us get down into single digits and I've seen us run up into the low 20s. COVID was devastating to us, no doubt, right? We lost the ability to get applicants and we lost the ability to hire people. No one wanted to work. So this current phase of vacancy rate is COVID related, no doubt. But, you know, We've had, we've had periods where it's been high. We've had periods where we've chipped away at this. Um, right now, it's the worst, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Mr. Prusky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I actually just have a comment for my colleagues. Um, I think you're seeing a recurring theme about the job market right now. And uh, we've heard that through several budgets. So I, I think we're going to continue to see that, but particularly for public safety, um, I, I want to thank uh, Chief Wolford and Lieutenant McAndrew. I, I had a chance to go visit the 911 center. And I just want to be candid. I just didn't speak with management. I spoke with staff. And part of it is they can't take a day off. They don't have enough people. And of course, that's an issue. And that's where we're trying to raise pay so that obviously we get additional people. Uh, but I think also with the 911 center, as sitting on this council prior, uh, we've asked for it, but it had to be in the budget. And this county executive has put it in the budget. So I know we can talk about the past and who's done what, whatever else, but the fact is that we have the opportunity here to improve services. I do know that uh, with 5G, 4G coming on, I've also talked to people about the technology. When uh, you're texting a 911 call versus there, some things have changed over the years as well. So obviously, um, if you're going to build that type of facility, you want to build it correct and you want to do it right. But I hope uh, as we go through this budget process that we look at uh, not only supporting the center, but those employees uh, that really need our help with raising their pay and encouraging people to apply for the job. So I hope that uh, everyone will join me and we'll have a, a approval of the budget with that. Thank you. All right, I do not see any additional hands. Um, so I will say thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that this project is um, coming to fruition and that you're being very careful and methodical about planning to make sure that you, um, you know, you leave room for changes that are inevitable in, um, you know, in the uh, emergency response arena. Um, so I, I appreciate the forward thinking and um, look forward to supporting this in our budget. Um, with that, seeing no first additional questions, thank you again very much for your time. And at this time, um, we will keep Chief Wolford on because it is time for the fire department to present. Um, in addition to Chief Tricia Wolford, we have Deputy Chief Ross Dinkle, Shannon Cleary Holt, Hannah Dyer. And when we get to the capital part, we will have Naomi McAllister, Beth O'Connell, and David Braun. And when you're ready, you may proceed. 
Good morning, everyone. Trisha Wolford, Fire Chief. Uh, Hannah, did you have anything to start with? Or if not, I will move right into slides. Um, so I'll just mention very quickly that the fire department's, uh, sorry, Hannah Dyer from the budget office. The fire department's pages in the budget book start on page 276. Um, and Chief, if you're, if you're ready to just go through your presentation, I'll just leave it at that. Yes, ma'am. In the interest of time and uh, keeping everything short and sweet as requested, uh, if the slides could go up. It, we have two slides for you. So we'll do the first slide, which is our operating budget highlights. Uh, you all have the sheets in front of you, but we would just wanted to put uh, a couple of the items that we'll be discussing today and that will be open for any questions. As you know, my team is here, Chief Dingle and Shannon Cleary Holtz, our analyst. Uh, so we'll go through our uh, three new positions, the apparatus as in our apparatus plan that we worked through last year. Well, this is now our third year of working through the plan. Uh, the fireboat replacements, our additional recruit class, which is an annual recruit class, and then the paramedic consultant study. Um, I'll flip to the next slide and then we can pull the slides down and discuss operating in capital second. Uh, so the capital budget highlights, you all have seen all these projects. There is nothing new. Uh, we've already had great discussion, but we're certainly open for more discussion. Uh, the repair and renovation for our volunteer fire stations, Fire suppression tanks, we are not adding any tanks this year. Uh, this is just the maintenance portion of it. And then the list of replacement fire stations. And as you all know, they're in some different form or phase. All of these are not in rebuild currently. Uh, along with one of our biggest asks for capital planning is our replacement training academy. This was a building that was built in the late 60s, had a remodel in the 80s, uh, and we have just outgrown it at this point. And then infrastructure repairs, which is a great collaboration uh, with Christine Romans and her group. So we'll pull those slides down, if you would, please. And I will uh, open the floor for any questions on operating budget or anything we could give you further information on. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3 Chief, good morning. Um, one of the things, I don't know that you did this slide presentation yet, but you said you were opening, opening operating budget. So what is the paramedic consultant study? And can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, it's a, a great conversation. So we, uh, what I found when I got here three years ago uh, is our rate of attrition for paramedics leaving the department. We were not meeting that need. Uh, we currently have, well, I shouldn't say currently, the plan from when I arrived and what we had been working on was 14 students per year. And that means those are our county firefighters that we're putting into paramedic school, 10 of which go to Anne Arundel Community College, and then four have the option if they live out of state to go to an approved program to hopefully make quality of life a little bit better for them. Uh, what we found is we weren't keeping up and the rate that we were seeing leaving along with the projected rate, um, we were actually expecting over 100 through our projections. So with uh, additional funding through ARPA money, uh, we realized we needed to do a little catch up. So last year we put 40 students uh, into paramedic training. Uh, this year the request is the additional 30. We think at this point we should even back out to that 14 to 16 per year and be able to keep up with that ALS certification requirement. Uh, so the study is in fact something that because this is a national issue, uh, we've had great conversation with the budget office to see, are we doing the best thing possible? It's extremely expensive for education. I think everybody knows that. Um, and we've been lucky to have different sources of funding. The study is to figure out, could we be doing this in a better way, either financially, uh, operationally, and we're hoping to gain some insight from that. Uh, I know speaking to my colleagues in the region and across the country, there, there has been no grand fix. Um, and this is one of the ways that uh, is probably the only way to do it. There's no recruitment. It's not like there's paramedics hanging out waiting to be hired. Um, so we're, we're trying to do it as financially responsible as possible, but we're hoping the study would give us a glimmer of hope of maybe a different way to do that. Thank you. Uh, 
I will jump in with one question. Um, I know that our community college has the new, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the name of the new center, but it's the Bio and Health Sciences Center. And I understand that there's some, I, I believe there's some emergency um, response training in that in, in that new um, center. So do you anticipate that could be a source? And do you have any idea how long before you might see candidates come from our community college? So that is actually where our students go. So we have the pleasure of uh, working in that building. Uh, that is our main partner uh, to work with Dawn and uh, her group there. So all of our students, majority of our students are there. Um, and then a lot of the civilians, if there are civilians in the class, uh, sometimes it is all Anne Arundel County Fire Department. If there are civilians, a lot of them are already on our hiring list or they're on a neighboring jurisdiction. This area is quite competitive for firefighters. Um, so we certainly try and scoop them up, uh, but most of them are already committed. Okay, so you're already very much on top of that, it sounds like. <laughs> yes, ma'am, and right. it's a phenomenal facility. If anybody hasn't seen it, you should check it out. Thank you, awesome. Uh, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Volke, District 3. All right, Chief, I'm, uh, I'm going back to ancient things again because it helps me to uh, know what's going on going forward. So you sent us back in 2021, a FY22 to FY25 large apparatus purchase plan. You probably remember that. I think that's part of how you're moving forward with the apparatus replacement. The indication in that on slide nine was that in FY23, you would need four and a half million dollars in terms of the apparatus replacement. Um, this budget is budgeting 11.7, almost 11.68. Uh, which is a $5 million increase over the prior year. So I guess the question that I would have is, uh, is there something new? Has that cost increased because of something else? Uh, it, I guess really what's the reason? Because it seems like it's a little bigger increase than what was initially anticipated. Plus there's also the base funding that was there with the increase on top of it. So maybe you can speak to that line item. It's on 277, that capital outlay line. That's what I'm looking at. Yes, sir. Uh, Tricia Wolford, Fire Chief. Uh, you are correct. 4.7, 4.74, I think, was uh, the original actual cost. So what you're seeing, 4.5. So we're in the same area there. Uh, and I'll have my budget analyst correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but as you can see, there are two boats on there instead of one. Um, so 1.5 of that, uh, the state is being very generous and working with us. Uh, the additional is the money that you're seeing put in there. Uh, Shannon, if I'm missing something that brings us close to that total, I'm looking at my sheet, and I think that is what we're seeing in that combination of cost. Yes, we're also getting the air wagon for the air shop, um, which I don't believe was on the original plan, uh, yes. uh, and then a, a box truck that would support the air shop as well. Uh, and so, yes. About uh, 650000 Thank you. So, Councilman Volke, that is in conjunction with the air shop lieutenant uh, that you see in the operating line item. Um, and that is part of uh, our SCBAs that we wear that have the breathing air. Uh, those cylinders and harnesses are being upgraded. The harnesses are being upgraded uh, with Bluetooth technology so that when they have their face piece on, we can clearly understand them. Uh, so the radio is integrated. That air shop lieutenant will be supervision along with a mobile asset so we don't have to take the air packs out of service. They go to the station, they upgrade it. Obviously, they need the truck with the supplies to move through. So that's the long answer of how we get to your dollar answer, but it all the math adds up. Okay, thank you. All right, seeing no additional questions from my colleagues, um, once again, I will say thank you very much for your time and your presentation and your organization. Um, and preparedness. It's great, greatly appreciated. Um, and we will hopefully see you soon. Um, and we'll send you questions if we have more. Um, at this time, we will move on to our chief administrative officer. Um, and our presenters will be Matt Power, um, our CAO, and Stephen Teru. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. You may Chair. begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Matt Power, uh, chief administrative officer. A pleasure to be here before you and the council. 
I think Stephen's going to run us through the nuts and bolts, and I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, deal with any issues that arise. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Council, Stephen Tru from the Budget Office. I'd like to turn your attention to page 102. That's where the CAO's budget will start. Page 103 is a comparative statement of expenditures. You'll notice at the top, there are seven different funds in the CAO's office. We're gonna talk about all of them with the exception of the Community Development Fund and the, sorry, uh, Workforce Development Fund as they both have their own presentations later on today. So moving right along, we're gonna go through a page turning exercise as each one of the bureaus in the CAO's office are kind of unique. So turning to page 104 is the new Police Accountability Board Bureau. Um, this council passed Bill 1622 relatively recently, which established that board. Um, this bureau accounts for the operations and the two new positions that came along with the board. So the makeup there is $500,000 is kind of the estimate for just general operations of the board. It's a new board. We'll kind of see how that transpires throughout the year next year to see if that needs to be adjusted and the two new positions associated with that board that this council also passed. Moving on to page 105, management and control. This is kind of the general operations of what actually is the CAO's office. When you think about it, you'll notice there's general fund and grant funds. I'll talk about the general fund increase of $1.4 million first. A million of that is a one-time contribution to the newly established Resiliency Authority. Um, that's for, to perform four regional assessment plans um, in the next year. And then roughly the rest of that increase is associated with personnel changes. Um, there is one new position um, funded this year. In addition to the Resiliency Authority kind of coming online um, as a full staff position that was not in last year's budget. Um, other than that, it's really the pay package and benefits associated with all of our employees. Because there's been a lot of questions about business and travel throughout these budget hearings, I just did want to address the increase in the business and travel line item. This is specifically related to two additional employees going through leadership development and three additional employees uh, getting a NACO membership. So really just enhancing those, those skill set and those memberships. Then I would like to talk about the $19.1 million in the grant fund. Um, as this council is very aware, um, a lot of the ARPA dollars come through the CAO's budget as the first went out to kind of outside agencies. I believe Mr. Trumbar kind of gave the detail of what projects are included throughout the budget of ARPA funding. As a high level, I'll just give you $3.3 million ish is roughly going out to ACDS. You'll hear a little bit about those funds um, during their presentation. There's some almost $13 million of that 19 is going to the CIP budget. Um, as, as PAYGO funding source for various projects. I believe you, if you haven't heard about all of them, you will hear about them during that review. And then there's roughly $1.3 million out to the Inclusive Venture Program through EDC. You will also hear about that program in EDC's presentation. Finally, there's about $500,000 that's going to workforce development through a federal uh, program for YouthWorks. Moving on to page 106, this is the CAO contingency fund that this council is very aware at. Um, the budget leaves this alone at $12 million, so no changes there. Page 107 is the Community Development Fund. You'll hear about that later. Page 108 is the Workforce Development Fund. You will also hear about that later. And then page 109, Tourism and, and Arts, this was a newly established funding source or newly established appropriation for the funding that goes through to the Arts Council and the Visitors Bureau. As state law dictates, 17% and 3% of our hotel tax goes to those. So the increase here is a special fund, but it's really just tied to our hotel tax revenue. So that's a high level summary of kind of the high level changes in the CAO's office. And as Mr. Powers mentioned, we are here to answer any questions. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, looking at page 104, the Police Accountability Bill, <clears throat> or the Police Accountability Board, excuse me, that comes out of that bill. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the 213 there is for the two positions that you intend to hire. And the $500,000, what is it intended to be spent on? What's sort of the expectation there? 
Matt Power, CAO. Uh, Councilman Volke, I think, you know, it, we'd be candid in saying that it's a, a brand new world out there and it's a uh, placeholder number, obviously. Uh, we know that there are going to be numerous needs as far as hiring judges, uh, potentially compensating board members and potentially uh, bringing on, um, you know, folks to advise the board as it gets established. So obviously any of the general funds in there that are not expended will revert. Uh, but it was to make sure that the board had enough resources to get established and effectively uh, staffed up and have the resources they need uh, to do the job effectively beginning, you know, July 1 when this entire new venture begins. May I ask a follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Power, thank you very much for that. Um, you mentioned hiring judges and outside consultants and people like that. Um, I guess what I want to make sure that I understand is, is this for the police accountability board or do you intend spending some of this money as well for the administrative charging committee? So is that sort of, are they simultaneous or are they independent and you're funding that somewhere else? Uh, at Power CAO, uh, Councilman Volk, you're correct. It is, it is for the administrative charging committee and the trial boards as well. Okay, thank you. And that's why the number is more of a placeholder until we know what the volume and uh, expectations really are going to be. Yeah, I was just thinking about the scope of what the PAB has versus the charging committee and trying to make sure I understood that. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions from my colleagues. Is there anything else that um, you would like to share with us or you we, we can always reach back out to you? Yeah, nothing else on my end. It's a pleasure to see mm -hmm. all of you again, and, and you know how to reach me, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you soon. Next up on our agenda is personnel, and once again, our presenters, we will have Stephen Taru, um, Ann Badowski, Susan Harold, Jacqueline Atkinson, Doug Hart, and Natalie Fretz. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, actually. Ann Badowski, Office of Personnel. Um, I think Stephen is just gonna give a high level look at our budget pages and then I will give a few comments and take any questions you may have. Madam Chair, members of the council, Stephen Saru from the Budget Office. Office of Personnel's budget starts on page 156 of your operating budget book. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to page 157. Um, the Office of Personnel is involved with six different funds, however, only two of them are budgeted as the other ones are our trust funds for the various uh, pension and OPEB trusts. Um, if we turn to page 159, we'll look at the general fund portion of the Office of Personnel. So you can see an increased bottom line of $710,000. Most of that, as most of personnel's budget, is in personnel services. So as mentioned in the budget book, the Office of Personnel has three new positions, personnel analysts um, coming on board in FY23. Um, that's about half of the increase shown in personal services there. In addition, we also have about $75,000 increase in contractual pay. This is largely for our background investigation group involved with public safety. Um, contractual employees also have a pay package, so it's associated with that. The remaining is just the associated pay package and benefit increases that you've seen countywide. Contractual services, supplies and materials and business and travel all have kind of small reductions. And a lot of that was one-time funding removed from this budget uh, from last year. Moving on to page 160, you will see the internal service fund known as the healthcare fund. The vast majority of these funds pay for healthcare claims for our current employees. Um, and we're seeing increase in claims costs, as I'm sure personnel will mention. Um, so this budget simply reflects our projection of what healthcare claims are going to do next year. Um, the removal down in grants contribution and other is simply the removal of a one-time contribution to the OPEB trust fund that we really base on the fund balance um, in the healthcare fund on how much we can or cannot contribute on top of our normal contribution to the OPEB fund. So the budget as it presents today allows the health insurance fund to be within our fund balance range for that fund. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Podowski to give her remarks. Thanks, Stephen. 
Um, good morning, Madam Chair and all the council members and Madam Auditor. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about our FY23 proposed budget. I know you're familiar with the responsibilities of the Office of Personnel. Um, we have a unique opportunity to work with all our employees and our retirees every day um, from their first day on the job, <clears throat> from recruitment and new employee orientation to promotion and retirement, from timekeeping and processing biweekly payroll to paying our retirees each month and all the phases in between, right? Our union negotiations, employee relations and discipline, as well as providing employee and retiree health benefits. Um, the office continues to be pretty flexible in how we provide our services to our employees. Um, we have come out on the other side of the pandemic, and but we have kept some services virtual and some back in person. So we continue to do our pre-retirement seminars and our wellness programs virtually. Those have been very successful in that environment, and we continue to do so. Um, but we have moved back to an in-person new employee orientation, which we think is good to be able to kind of have that hands-on approach with our new employees as they come on board. Our total budget, as Stephen has talked about, for the office is um, $8.1 million, and more than 70% of that is in our salaries and benefits. The um, budget does not include any major projects for us, but it does include continued funding for our countywide tuition reimbursement program, our countywide critical skills training, as well as our, um, a class of our third class cohort for our leadership development program um, that we have partnered with Anne Arundel Community College on. The first cohort graduated 25 um, employees last fall, and our second cohort of 25 just began their second um, part, um, kickoff for their six-month program two weeks ago. So we're excited about that, and we look forward to a third class this um, upcoming fiscal year. Um, the proposed budget does also include three new positions, as Stephen pointed out, three personnel analyst positions. The first analyst position would be dedicated to our class and comp unit, which currently only has one full-time analyst. The county workforce has grown over the course of the years and our, that unit has not. So the staff would be helping us keep up with the number of desk audits and the reclassification requests that continue to come in through all our departments. The other two analysts would be provide direct um, support to our employee development and employee services, AKA our recruitment team. Um, I, um, to give, allow us to spread the wealth of our departments and the responsibilities for recruiting for the departments um, more broadly, um, which will also allow each of the analysts a better opportunity to address the particular needs in those departments. As you have heard, most recently, even just before me um, this morning, some of the departments in their buzzer presentations have talked about their struggles to fill their positions. Um, and there have been several positions that have had a historical um, difficulty hiring. Our engineers, our planners, detention officers, even our PCOs and our dispatchers that you just heard about this morning. Anne Arundel County is an employer of choice for people. We have generous health benefits, flexible work schedules, particularly with teleworking right now for those of classifications that allow telework. Um, we also have a divine pension contribution and a defined benefit um, plan. And we also have the flexibility of our defined contribution plan for those who don't intend to make a career here at the county. Um, and we have competitive pay. Um, however, the application numbers are down and they are down compared to previous years. Um, we're not alone in that. I think this is a nationwide problem, but it is something that we continue to battle regularly. Many times we've had to repost repost positions and recruitments um, because a selected candidate either declines the offer, they may have taken another job, or we've actually even had situations where the candidates don't even show up for the interviews. So they've gotten that far and then just don't show. It really is an employee's market um, and they have a lot to choose from. The recruitment process is collaborative. We work with each department um, very closely actually on every recruitment and we continue to expand our outreach on how we are posting those recruitments, not just on our countywide website, we use LinkedIn, we use Indeed, we're on governmentjobs.com. We are working diligently to spread um, our uh, announcements so we get as many applicants as possible. Um, every recruitment is an opportunity to improve that process and, and we continue to do that regularly. Um, I would like to give you just a brief update on the class and comp study, which started in late 2020. Um, the goal of that examination was to really look at our classifications as well as the compensation. 
and to look at that compared to our peers around us and against the private market. So it wasn't just about money, it was also about classifications and updating some of those pieces. And so that has been in the works for over a year now. PRM was our vendor selected to do this. They conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with our department heads. They also did webinars to explain what was gonna be happening for all the employees to engage them on the front end of this. They created what we call the JAQ, which was their job analysis questionnaire that they were asked to complete so they could be able to really understand that what they were doing in their job is that they were appropriately classified. Um, admittedly, this has taken us longer than we anticipated, I think than anybody probably thought about. Um, and part of that was actually due to a low participation from the employees. Um, we just didn't get the feedback we were looking for on those JAQs. And so we had to kind of do some shifting along the way. So we, we created some um, focus groups and we did some other things to get to some classifications that we had not heard from and just found different ways to get the information so the vendor could actually work to get us a fruitful product. So they are currently reviewing the data that they have received and we hope to have a report with recommendations at the end of the fiscal year. So um, we don't have that yet, but it is something we are anticipating by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, lastly, just um, the office did negotiate with 11 unions this year. Um, uh, you may recall that we had legislation earlier this year, actually late 2021, that removed the cap for the number of unions, um, bargaining units that could be allowed, and that with that passage, we were able to certify the PCO threes and fours to a new union under with the Teamsters, so that was our 11th union. So um, what we negotiated with all of them over the winter, and I can um, probably say that we have agreements with all of them, and all of those agreements have been ratified. Um, they were all one-year agreements, so we will be doing this again next year, <laughs> but um, the good news is, is that we have 11 agreements. Um, and for the most part, they all included a COLA and a merit, um, and then adjustments to allowances or field training and some increases in tuition reimbursement rates. We have provided Madam Auditor a list of um, the summary of those negotiations um, and ratified copies of the TAs. Um, with that, I will take any questions that you may have. No hands from my colleagues. <laughs> I guess that means you had a very thorough presentation and we've got all the information or we will be coming up with questions <laughs> to bring back to you later. So Not a um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is Office of Law, and I'm going to change course a little bit here. Um, I will introduce the, our lead presenter and then ask them to uh, introduce any folks that are with them. So our county attorney, Greg Swain. Good morning. I'm County Attorney Greg Swain. Uh, with me this morning is Deputy County Attorney Hamilton Tyler and our office manager, uh, Sharon Hawthorne, as well as our budget analyst, uh, Darlene Flynn. I think everyone on the council has a pretty good idea of what we do at the Office of Law, so I won't provide a summary of our workings beyond the written material which you already have. I would, though, like to note um, something new this year, and this is coming from our litigation team, where most of the time we're working very hard to minimize money going out the door. Um, this year, as a result of our affirmative litigation efforts, which is led by Mr. Tyler, uh, this year, we'll start a flow of money coming in the door as a result of our settlement of the opioid case against the opioid manufacturers. That's a $31 million settlement, which is going to be paid out over 18 years. And we're expecting that July of this year, we'll get the first payment, um, which is actually a double payment of about $4.3 million. Um, we expect annual payments after that to be about half that amount for the first 10 years and then slightly less for the balance of the eight years. Um, as you might know, one of the large manufacturers, which is Purdue, is in bankruptcy. And that case, though, is working its way through the bankruptcy court. So we do expect, expect some additional settlement funds when that is resolved, which we estimate would be uh, about another $10 million over the next 18 years. And finally, we still have remaining claims against drugstores uh, that are in our case in circuit court, works. those cases against drugstores throughout the country are being tried, and some of them are being settled. So we do expect uh, either, through uh, either through judgment or settlement 
additional funding coming from that source. Now with that, we're happy to answer any questions you have. I'll turn it over to Darlene Flynn for any comments she'd like to make. Thank you. Good morning, Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office. Um, the Office of Law's budget begins on page 92 of the proposed budget. Um, if you look at page 93, I'll just do a real quick overview of the changes in the budget. There is a um, FY23 proposed budget of 5.1 million. Um, that's about a $300,600 change over FY22 approved. Um, if you look down below at the uh, object level, the majority of that increase is in personal services of 273,700, and that is a result of the countywide pay package that you're familiar with. And then there is an increase in contractual services of 26,900, um, and that's due to um, an increase with case management software in, in the countywide publishing of the code. Um, and that's a contractual change. And that's really the only changes in the budget. Are there any questions? Again, I think you were pretty straightforward. So thank you very much. And um, it's always nice to hear that money's coming into the county too from one of our departments. So um, I know that was a, a nationwide team effort. So uh, thank you very much. All right, I guess we will, we will move on to our next presentation. Um, which is the which is the Department of Finance non -depart excuse me non departmental, and Chris Trumbauer will be uh, our lead presenter. And I might you may be solo. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I thought we were sorry. I thought we were going to do Office of Budget first, uh, but I can roll through. Non I'm so sorry. You no, you are correct. Y yes, I I skipped over it um, on my agenda here. Let's okay. let's stick with the order that we have so we don't um, confuse anyone. Okay, very good. Well, I'll just introduce myself, uh, Budget Officer Chris Trumbauer. Uh, the Office of the Budget has an extremely boring budget to present to you, and I will turn it over to um, Sam Chiriaco to run through it. Good morning, everyone. Sam Chiriaco, Budget Office. The Office of the Budget's section in the budget book starts on page 150. If you go to page 151, I will talk briefly about our budget. As you can see, we have an increase in personal services of 102,000. That is due to the countywide pay package. We also have a small increase in contractual services. And this year, the budget office will be using that to scan some documents, uh, one-time costs in our file room that we have so that we can have more space in there and digitize all of the extra documents that we have. And those are all the big changes that we have. So Chris or I can take any questions at this time. Well, it looks like we are, we're going to move on quickly to um, the finance non-departmental um, pretty quickly anyway, because I don't see any questions. So uh, thank you very much, Ms. Chiriaco. And, and, and Chris, you may proceed. Great. Uh, thank you, Chris Trumbauer, Budget Officer. Um, so good morning, Council. I'm going to run through uh, a series of funds that are all kind of what I call the island of misfit toys because they don't have anywhere else to go. So we just package them together. Um, so these will begin on page 133 of your budget book. Uh, there's several of these. I'll run through them quickly. If you have any questions, feel free to stop or ask at the end. But on page 133, you'll see a summary uh, of all of them. So flipping the page to 134, uh, this is just PAYGO. This is cash that we send over to the capital budget. Uh, as you can see in the chart to the right, uh, it's a significant amount this year. In fact, it's a historical amount, uh, $205 million that we're deploying into the capital budget. And uh, I think you've seen all of the capital projects in the budget uh, so far at this time. So you know what that is going to. Next page, 135. This is our tax increment districts um, known as TIFs. So this is when um, the proceeds of uh, a particular district's um, tax assessments go to particular um, outcomes. You can see on the right a uh, table of the different funds. And uh, there's just a couple things I want to highlight for you here. Uh, you'll see um, a little bit of noise in the numbers for the Arundel Mills uh, TIF. And that is because there was a legal settlement with uh, the uh, live casino. Um, and so the county had to offer them a refund. So you can see the original um, uh, expenditure 
uh, in 22 is much different than the estimate of 22. And then you'll see going forward, there's an adjustment of about a million point one uh, in 23. Uh, the other thing I wanted to call to your attention is in the Odenton Town Center, as you heard in the capital budget presentations, uh, we are kind of reactivating that uh, transit oriented development project. And so there's 19.8 uh, million dollars that's now recognized in the Odenton TIF that will uh, support that project. And that was discussed in the capital budget. Okay, uh, flipping to 136, um, the, these are special tax districts. Um, nothing too exciting here. Uh, we present these every year. You have legislation for, I think, um, eight different uh, STDs and um, four of them are here and four of them are in the um, SCVDs. But the one thing I did want to call to your attention, you'll see a decrease in the Arundel Gateway um, fund, and that is due to a bond redemption uh, that happened. So that's why that amount went down, which is a little bit unusual, but perfectly appropriate. Uh, page 137, uh, this is just simple debt service. This is what we pay for our capital projects. Uh, so you can see that amount um, and compared to the last several years. Next page on 138. Um, this is what we call mandated grants. So there's three or four things here. It's our uh, payment to the city of Annapolis. It's also our share of the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. And then finally, this is where um, we house the fund for the um, Anne Arundel County Conference and Visitors Bureau and the Arts Council of Annapolis. Um, so you can see there is a modest increase this year, and that's primarily attributable to the increase that we have to pay um, SDAT. Okay, next page is 139. Uh, this is just Whitmore Garage. Same amount every year, pretty boring, no change. Um, page 140, okay, this is an interesting one. This is what we call the Installment Purchase Agreement Program. And this is simply uh, to support the um, easements for farmland and other open space. So on this page on 140, this is um, the actual uh, expenditure. And then in a few pages on 145, you'll see the debt service uh, that's related to that. But on this, it's just a general fund contribution. And you can see it's very little change uh, there. Uh, next page 141. Uh, this is a contribution to the self-insurance fund. Uh, there is a big change here, and that's because you might remember last year in fiscal year 22, um, we did our payment to the self-insurance fund with one-time funding instead of recurring. So what we're doing now is we are making up for that, and we're going back and getting up to speed with recurring funding. Um, so that's why there's a big increase this year. Page 142, uh, this is our contribution to the rainy day fund. I think you guys like this one. Uh, you'll see it's a, a large contribution this year. It's $23.5 million that will uh, project us to be at the cap, what we hope will be the new cap uh, when you pass Bill uh, 5022, which would allow the county to have 7% reserves. Um, this would be great. It'll protect our AAA bond rating and have uh, ample reserves for that time in the future. We don't know when, but when the county will experience its next economic downturn. Page 143, this is the contribution to our OPEB fund. Uh, we're very proud of the progress we're making on OPEB fund. Um, this year, we do fully fund the county contributions um, as listed. And uh, you can see that amount in the chart at right. Okay, we're getting close to the end here, folks. Page 144 is our contribution to community development. This is just a particular class of capital projects, and this is the local match requirements that are associated with state and federal grants. You can see that's been pretty consistent over the last several years, and there's no change in FY23. Um, okay, page 145 is the uh, debt service component of the previous page I walked through with the IPA uh, program. And page 146 is the um, video lottery impact aid. This is uh, money that we get from um, Live Casino. And uh, there is, you'll see that there's an increase this year. And that's largely because the LDC, the Local Development Council, is sending more money to the capital projects um, in FY23 compared to what they did in FY22. And you can see that their spending plan is listed on the following page, uh, which is 147. 
Okay, page 148. Uh, this is just what we kind of call contributions to other funds. Again, some different things packaged together, but this is where you'll find the $10 million for the new housing trust fund. This is where we have the $16.5 million one time contribution to the pension fund. And remember, we're also increasing the contribution to the garage vehicle operating fund because of the dramatic increase in fuel prices. Um, so that's all listed there. Um, page 149 provides a breakout of all of our impact fee districts. Um, remember, there are seven districts, but they do not align with the council districts, so sometimes that creates some confusion, uh, but they're all listed um, in the chart on page 149. And that is it for the Island of Misfit Toys this year. I always appreciate how you managed to bring humor to your presentation on on the on a topic of of budget items. So that's greatly appreciated. Um, I don't see any hands for questions, however. So um, I'm always trying to pause and give folks a minute to you know press that little yellow hand. But seeing none, um, I believe we can move on to the county executive's office. And I believe you have Dr. K. Bogusta Brown, Pete Hill, and Asha Smith joining you. Um, I expect them. Uh, and Stephen is the budget analyst and can walk through. But I will turn it over to them. Thank you all. Good to see you. And I'm sure this isn't the last you've seen of me in this budget season. <laughs> nope. And feel free to introduce anyone else's with you that I did not have on my list. Great, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kay Augusta Brown, Chief of Staff with the Administration. Um, I also am joined with, do I have Pete Hill? I think Pete Hill is here, uh, Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. I and am here, also, Dr. K. Good morning. And I also have Jennifer Purcell, who is our Director of Special Projects, who's joined us as well. Um, Stephen's going to run us through the budget, and we are here to answer any questions that you might have. Great to see you all. Madam Chair, members of the Council, Stephen Theroux from the Budget Office. County Executive's budget starts on page 85. Similar to the CAO's office, the County Executive's office is made up of a few different funding sources, the Arundel uh, Economic Development Corporation, that will be discussed later. Um, general funds, Laurel Racetrack funds, and the VLT crew grants. So we're going to talk about everything except for Economic Development Corporation as they have their own presentation later. So similar to the CAO, we're going to go through kind of bureau by bureau. So starting on page 87 is the county executive's office. So this is kind of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you'll see the general fund increase of $354,000. The bulk of that is in personal services. Um, some of that is for a new contractual position through uh, Pete Hill Shop in the EDI office, um, and also just in general, just the pay packet benefit changes associated with all of our county departments. Um, contractual services increases just a little bit. Again, that is some operations uh, related to the EDI office as it comes online and gets fully ramped up for their duties. Um, and supplies and materials, there's a small increase. And this is really for additional communications funding and outreach. Moving on to the next page, page 88. Um, this is the Economic Development Corporation. We will hear about them in their own presentation. Page 89 is the Laurel Racetrack Fund. The, um, the details of how this funding is broken out is actually all listed on this page. Moving on to the next is the VLT Community Grant Program. Uh, you just saw Mr. Turnbauer run through the entirety of the VLT fund and the details and finance on departmental. So I'm not going to go through all of those details here. They're all listed on page 147 of the budget book. Um, similar to Laurel Racetrack, these funds are reflective of the Local Development Council's request for the funding level um, through that committee. So with that, that's a high level overview and we will turn it over to the council for questions. Any questions from my colleagues? All right, I guess we will keep on trucking. Um, next is the Arundel Community Development Services and we have Aaron Karpowitz. And feel free to introduce anyone else who might be presenting with you, Ms. Karpowitz. 
Hi, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the council. Um, I'm Erin Karpowitz, and yes, I have James Sylvester, our Chief Operating Officer, Beth Brush, our Planning Director, and Dave Sims, Community Grants Manager, on with me today, and our Budget Officer, Stephen Saru. Um, I also have a PowerPoint, if uh, someone's able to bring that up. I don't know. There we go. So I'm not going to go through each program at ACDS today. We have a lot, um, but I wanted to highlight some areas where we have newer initiatives in the Community Development Services Fund, which is on your budget book on page 107. Um, under our county general fund this year, uh, we are proposing a small shelter demonstration project, and that's really going to help us to um, expand the continuum of resources that we have available to our residents already experiencing homelessness in the county. There are homeless individuals who are elderly or have one or more physical or mental disabilities that make it really difficult for them to be served in our existing shelter, uh, our, our existing um, shelter bed uh, inventory. So this would allow us to support an experienced provider uh, with some operating funds to make uh, these specialized beds available while freeing up some of the space at our other shelters. We also um, want to mention that there are some additional general support costs um, associated with the increased work that ACDS is doing um, in, on behalf of the county related to the housing um, and monitoring and compliance and just general uh, policy around housing and community development, as well as database development and data performance and impact management. Um, next, um, the, the next slide, if you don't mind, thanks. Um, our community support grants. This year, we're proposing similar funding amounts to last year, which was funded at $2 million. But this year, a little bit different um, compared to last year. Last year, we had $2 million in ARPA funding. Um, this year, we're proposing $1 million of that be funded in the general fund and $1 million through the ARP grant from the CAO's budget. So overall, this will allow us to support nonprofit organizations that are addressing a COVID-related need or loss of revenue or address one of the county's human service priorities. And it wouldn't have to be uh, you know, just restricted to COVID related, like the ARP funds um, require. So we're looking at making 69 awards this year, and those would address various areas, including youth programming, programming for older adults, people with disabilities, uh, community development projects, and also programs to address health and safety. And just to give you an idea, so far in FY22, and, and we're only partway through the year, the community support grants collectively have helped us serve over 50,000 residents in the county with services. So um, that's a, it's an important program, an import, important resource and a way to really support our nonprofit organizations who are based in the community, get those services out. Next slide. Uh, you heard Mr. Trumbauer mention the housing trust fund. Um, this is the $10 million investment to seed the housing trust fund, which will help us to provide affordable housing for low and moderate income households in the county. county. It would prioritize creating affordable rental opportunities through development and redevelopment, as well as support for group homes for special populations, and then also creating new affordable home ownership opportunities because there are great needs in that area. And it would help us create housing opportunities for people from a range of incomes um, in our county. The community develop, I'm sorry, the next slide, please. Thank you. The Community Development Fund is our list of about five federal grants that um, total, they consistently total around $9 million each year. Um, actually, this also includes about $500,000 in funds from the federal government uh, to fund the eviction prevention program. They reallocated some funding to our eviction prevention program because of our success on that. Um, so that's the only new one this year. And, and these collectively, these funds are our entitlement funds. It's also our um, competitive funds that we apply for through the federal government and the US Department of Housing and Community Development. And it allows us to continue our affordable housing and community development activities in, in the um, county. 
So, and finally, if we go to the next slide, you're not gonna see this on ACDS's budget page, but it's part of the CAO's ARPA grants on page 105 of your budget. Um, I already talked about the community uh, support grant program, but it also includes about $3 million to continue the county's eviction prevention program. Since the pandemic began, we've been able to serve over 3,200 households and getting um, over $25 million in payments out to landlords on their behalf to keep them housed. And just because we've been successful in getting that funding effectively out the door, we have been able to secure, secure additional funding from the state of Maryland, um, Maryland, uh, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development Secretary Ken Holt, um, you know, gave us a shout out at a recent statewide conference, and they've also given us an additional $6 million in eviction prevention funds um, that they had to reallocate from other counties. And um, so that's going to help carry us through, I think, part of the fiscal year, but most of those fund that funding needs to be expended by September 30th. And so we're requesting $3 million in ARP funds to continue the eviction prevention. And we're anticipating that allow us to continue at a reduced rate as we kind of ramp down the program, hopefully um, through the end of the calendar year, as we expect, um, you know, we don't expect evictions just to all of a sudden end. Um, we expect them to continue at some level, especially as the moratorium on evictions has ended and courts have um, fully opened up after COVID surges and the Omicron variant had closed them through um, the beginning of this calendar year. So that is um, the majority, that's the majority of the funds that uh, we are requesting. We also do administer the video lottery terminal funds on behalf of the county. Um, and, and we're excited to uh, continue that service for the county. So that's all I have in my presentation and I'll um, open it up to questions if you have any. I will just jump in with one quick question, and um, I'm hoping you can answer this. If not, maybe there's someone else who can. But um, with respect to the new housing trust fund, is there a plan for uh, for how distributions will be made from that fund? You know, or, or what kind of criteria, or will it be um, you know from the bulk of it of the fund itself, or will it be you know an interest based? Um, so I'm just curious what what kind of plans or you know what kind of criteria for a project to um, access those funds? Sure, thanks Councilwoman Radvian. Um, that, that's a great question. We actually, we anticipate the majority of the funds will be used to develop affordable rental housing because that's where the big need is. We actually have an existing program where we do take applications from developers that would like to come in and develop affordable housing. And so we have a program and policy uh, procedures in place. And so we would take those because of the timeline of developments and the way they happen, we do anticipate taking those applications on a rolling basis. And we do have pretty um, strict underwriting criteria by which we would evaluate those projects. And I, I imagine that would transfer over, even though those typically that typically has to do with the federal funding that we get through the federal home program. We would use very similar underwriting and policy guidelines on that. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Seeing no additional hands, um, I will once again say thank you to uh, Ms. Karpowitz for your presentation and for your hard work um, and your very important work. Um, and we will reach out to you if we have any additional questions. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Next up is the Anne Arundel Workforce Development Corporation, and the presenter or the lead presenter will be Kirk uh, Kirkland Murray. And uh, Mr. Murray, if you have anyone else you'd like to um, introduce that will be joining you, uh, please do so. No, it'll just be myself this morning. So, thank you very much for your time. Good morning, everyone, Madam Chair. Um, again, my name is Kirkland Murray. I'm President and CEO of Anne Arundel Workforce Development Corporation. As you guys are aware, we run the workforce development program here in Anne Arundel County. Our primary goal is to make sure that Anne Arundel County residents have the tools and the skills they need to be successful in their career 
and along with working with our business community to help them to attract, retain, and upskill the talent that they need to continue to grow and be successful here in Anne Arundel County. So um, the good news is starting off that we're coming in asking for the same amount of money that we did last year. Whereas the funding that we received from the county is a smaller portion of the grants we receive. It is very important to um, helping us to make sure that we have a premier workforce development system in Anne Arundel County and that we're able to serve all of Anne Arundel County residents. A lot of the majority of our funding comes from federal sources or state sources, and there are restrictions on who we can serve under that funding. The flexibility that the county funding gives us allows us to be able to do the projects and be able to serve all Anne Arundel County residents to make sure that they are successful. So um, I don't know if my presentation has been pulled up yet. To, it's just a narrative of, or it might have been handed to you, it's just a breakdown of our budget. The largest portion of our budget is staffing. Um, this is for mainly for our community career connection um, staff. You know, we have staff that are in targeted communities in Annapolis, Pasadena, uh, West County, um, and that's where this funding comes from to support them. It also is a little bit of my time from when I'm doing um, projects for the county and a little bit of our communications person and our grant development. We cannot charge grant development costs to federal funds, so this funding allows us to do that. That also includes our fringe rate. Uh, fringe rate went up a little bit um, this year because, um, as you know, um, as you know, one of the quasis, and around the Workforce Development Corporation is not part of the county pension system. So one of the things that we have done to make sure that we can uh, attract and retain a talent workforce is that we did increase um, employees' contributions, the employer's contribution to employees' 403B program. The rest of this falls into corporate support. The main reason that we received this county grant is because years ago we were a county agency when we were privatized. There are a lot of services that now we have to pay for. For example, we are not in any county facilities. We're in um, commercial facilities. Um, we pay for our legal fees. We pay for our audit fees, all those type of things. So this um, corporate support or administrative support um, allows for that. But the bulk of our money is going towards providing services to Anne Arundel County residents. There's a small portion that is supporting some of the costs of the Career Center up in Lithicum Heights. Um, but again, the bulk of the money is going to direct services to county residents. Um, about a month and a half ago, um, about two months ago, I sent it to you guys a, um, a study that we did. It was an impact study to show the impact that uh, workforce development is having on the local economy. And what it showed was for every dollar we invested, $8.90 um, $8 is the return on investment. So for this $469,700 that we're asking for for this year, that should generate 4.8, um, 4 excuse me, $4,800,000, $4 million in return to the county. So I think this is a great return on your investment. I don't think you even get those odds in Vegas. So, um, but that's all I really have, unless you have any questions for me. All right, seeing no hands from my colleagues, I will just uh, say thank you very much for the great work that you guys are doing. I um, follow you pretty closely um, because I know I'll, there are a good number of folks in my constituent, who, in my, excuse me, in my district who um, can really take advantage of the work that you do. So um, it's very much appreciated. And thank and, you. And thank you for all your support and all, all the members of the County Council and the administration. All right, we will um, we'll be in touch if, if we need anything. And thanks again for your time today. All right, thank you. Next on our lineup is um, the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation.
And our lead presenter will be Mr. Ben Burge. And I will ask Mr. Burge to introduce any of the other uh, panelists who will be uh, joining him. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to discuss our budget today. Um, with me today, um, I have a few people. Um, I have uh, Rosa Cruz, uh, Jill Seaman, Lisa Grunder, uh, and in our conference room, we have Christina Holliday, um, Wes McQuillan, uh, Stephen Pramosh, and who am I missing? Is that Jonathan? Jonathan Boniface. Sorry about that. Um, the, uh, the, the square is kind of small, sometimes hard to tell people. Um, and when we're doing the disjointed staff meetings, it makes it even more challenging, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Pam Brown and I are, I think, the last one standing between you and wrapping up your agency budget reviews, so I'll be brief. Um, as you all know, we've been pretty busy. Uh, what you might not see behind the scenes are some important changes. AAEDC has been saying for years that we would soon have our CRM system up and uh, making better use of that data. Uh, thanks to the uh, leadership of our Vice President for Business Development, Wes McQuillan, that time has come and we're using our system effectively. We have a new and improved grant application portal, which makes uh, reviews easier and accountability better. We have a new loan software for the finance team, which will better automate that system and reduce paper. And believe it or not, it actually costs less than the system we were using. And finally, thanks to Brittany Rawlings on our ag team, uh, we're going to put our equipment, our farm equipment rental applications online. Um, this will help with our uh, accountability and um, actually uh, make things a lot more legal. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of insurance issues that go with um, each equipment rental application. And of course, we remain one of the few economic development offices in the country uh, reporting performance metrics as we continue to work with the Arundel staff team. You have our, our documents before you. I won't uh, read everything to you. Um, it highlights the activity both in AAEDC uh, and in the business community. Our first order of business um, on the second slide of our presentation is the Inclusive Ventures Program. Uh, we launched the IVP a little over a year ago. Oh, here it comes. There we go. You jumped, there we go. Oh, back one. There's one in the middle. There we go, thanks. Uh, we launched this a little over a year ago. Um, in this budget, uh, in the CAO's budget, there's a $1.2 million in ARP funds to cover uh, four, four, co four cohorts in each of the next two years, basically doubling that program. It will also cover our share of a bilingual business counselor supported through the Small Business Development Center. And I cannot overstate the need for an additional bilingual uh, business counselor. Another change in the last year, uh, if you go to the next slide, is our Volt Growth Program. This program is supported by proceeds from video lot lottery terminals and provides financing for pre-market tech companies and other innovative products. You can see on the next slide, uh, which outlines our total loan activity last year, that those things slowed down during the pandemic, not surprisingly, uh, those numbers are uh, surging now and are expected to keep growing uh, throughout the year. So our finance team, uh, Steve Promotion and his folks will be very busy. On the following slide is a summary of uh, our COVID relief grant programs. Uh, the team was quite busy giving out about $33 million in COVID relief grants and we continue to find innovative uses of ARP funds to meet business needs. And the following slide shows the source of the grant funding with county directed programs leading the way. I would be remiss if I didn't reemphasize the important role you all played in getting money in the hands of business owners quickly. In other jurisdictions, the county councils uh, wanted to hold hearings on the funds and how they were spent. If you think about your calendar, your legislative calendar, and the time it takes to get even the simplest legislation passed, you get an idea of how long businesses in those other jurisdictions needlessly waited for assistance while their elected officials held hearings. 
In almost all cases, we had money in the hands of our businesses before our counterparts even open up their application forms. We have, uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, that we have testimonials for each of you um, uh, in recognition of, of the help you've provided in doing that and how, what it meant to those businesses. On the next slide, we show how involved we are with our, oh yeah, there we go, with our partner organizations. These are really our coworkers. They're organizations for whom we serve on boards um, and as mentors and as sponsors and as collaborators. And it's a very important part of our work. Um, on the next slide, we've provided data um, about our partners at SBDC and SCORE. And I will close out with some highlighted businesses that show tremendous growth in the county uh, just in the last year. Um, I think one was, or is that the order now? Um, anyway, um, so Catalan plans to expand its uh, vaccination and gene therapy production to bring an additional 700 employees. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Amazon seems as though it can't get any bigger, but has plans for uh, a redevelopment business, redeveloped business, business park in Hanover. Uh, next slide. Um, Dominion Electric will add 50 employees. Uh, Kratos will be expanding their defense systems manufacturing in Glen Burnie. And finally, uh, Dragos keeps our grid secure and keeps us from having a, another colonial pipeline experience that our country faced um, a few years ago. Uh, and they, I, I bring this up because we had a, we had a discussion about this um, in the office. Their, their slogan seems a little aggressive, safeguarding civilization, but if you think about what they're protecting, it's, they're probably understating their point. Anyway, um, I believe that brings us to the end of our uh, presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Well, it looks like my colleagues don't have any questions, at least right now. Oh, wait, I spoke too soon. Ms. Pickard, you may have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I, I just, I should have done this with every agency that went before us, but I really do want to, to thank you all for your level of professionalism and responsiveness to our, our business community. I heard firsthand um, from um, some of your customers who really did um, uh, acknowledge, especially folks who have businesses in, in other counties, how well um, Anne Arundel County Economic Development uh, was so incredibly responsive um, over the last couple of years. And then I also have to give a shout out to all your folks who have supported both the Glen Burnie um, Town Center uh, Farmers Market and the Revitalization Task Force over the last couple of years. So just Thank you for all you do. Well, thank you for um, including us in these discussions. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of the way we do the farmer's markets where we, we organize it, we get it off the ground, and then we hand it off to a chamber or a similar organization and have them run it and, and reap the profits. I think it's a great model. Um, and I'm really glad we have something like that in place. And certainly we're all, we're, we are all hands on deck for revitalizing not only Glen Burnie, but some of our other um, economically business underserved uh, communities. Well, I will wrap up and say thank you uh, for all the great work that you do. Um, I, I, I think we all get your monthly um, Arundel Biz newsletter and it's always nice to keep tabs on all the great work that you're doing. So. Um, I feel like I'm I'm regularly looped in. So thank you for all, all the things that you're doing and um, we'll reach out if we have any additional questions. Thank you very much. All right. Our final presentation for today will be from the Partnership for Children, Youth and Families um, led by Dr. Pam Brown. And um, I will let her introduce the other panelists from uh, Children, Youth and Families. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Isn't life good? So I'm sharing my screen, right? Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you. Let me find that, whoops. 
okay, my screening was disabled, so I guess you're going to do it. Yay! That's what I like. So, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here from the Partnership for Children, Youth and Families. You know that we are your local management board. We have been around since 1996, so it's way over 30 years now. We are, I think we're bigger and stronger than we've ever been. These are the Maryland Human Services article and the county code that lays out what our responsibilities are in the county. Basically, we are a planning organization, we are a funding organization, and we also do some direct services. One of the things we're probably well known for is doing both the health needs assessment and poverty amidst plenty. Every three years, we have also really focused in on the areas of most need in the county, and we call those our communities of hope. And I think many of you are already familiar with that work. So can I know my slide won't work? So next slide, please. Because mine won't turn it. Thank you. So we've had it, obviously, we worked extremely hard during the pandemic. We pinched it for the county early on and we just continued to do work. We also do work uh, generally on a regular basis around homeless families and prevention of homelessness. These are, you can all read, but obviously we do a lot around food. We've uh, managed 507,000 individuals during, since the beginning of the pandemic. We also work a lot with homeless families and the prevention of homelessness. We do basic needs for families that can be anything from paying their rent when they're in a bad scrape, trying to help them with car repair so they can get back to work. We call that our systems of care. We have navigators, we have a warm line and we have teams. Our community resource initiative care teams are called cricket teams. They're made up of all of the different agencies in the county. We troubleshoot with families, try, doing our best to try to keep them out of government services and help them to be as self-sufficient as they can. Again, we've served a lot of families through our teams. We went into the distribution business during the pandemic and still are to some extent. You can see how many um, pieces of PPP we delivered. Our other services that we do directly or that we fund through grassroots agencies include childhood support, mentoring, juvenile diversion, academic help. We've, we've served around 1400 individuals. And we also do a lot of work around homeless youth and immigrant youth and I will talk about that a little bit later. Next slide, please. So we are an almost completely grant funded agency and every year we have to look at all of the grants that are coming in. And I think one of the things that's difficult to understand about the partnership is that some of our work is a, an educated guess around about the time of May and June because we've applied for a whole load of funding and we're still waiting for that funding to come in. So we have to talk to the budget office, which is very uncomfortable for them as a county-based budget office about what confidence we have and what level of confidence we have for what funds are going to come in. And so we, over the 30 years, obviously, we've become very adept at this behavior where we are constantly looking for when funds end, trying to figure out where the next set of funding is, and managing a diversity of funds, because frankly, in that way, we act like a not-for-profit. And the more that you diversify your funds, the more likely you are to stay in business. So obviously, we've been in business with, with this system for 30 years, and, and we expect to be in business for another 30 years. Next slide, please. So our budget this year is 3.5 million. There are 18 separate funding sources. Here are all the programs we operate, and you can see we do a lot around basic needs, around homelessness, around diversion, around rapid rehousing. We also do a lot of planning because that's one of our main purposes. So we have our communities of hope, we have our needs assessments. I work closely with the Early Childhood Coalition, I'm the chair. Um, we work on race equity, we do a lot around youth homelessness. So all of those we consider to be our strategic work, our planning work. And then 
we fund programs. So we're not just a, an operator. We also fund, we apply for grants. We get a big uh, chunk of money from the state. We try very hard to work with grassroots agencies. That also involves a level of te technical support because one of the things that happens for grassroots agencies is they tend not to have a strong administrative core. So one of the behaviors for the partnership throughout all these years has been to really help small agencies to continue and prosper. And that includes a whole load of technical assistance. Next slide, please. So I've lost the slide, but I will continue and I'll come back to it if I have to. So we have made three ARPA requests to the county. The first one is a second year request. We've already operated this program for the for one year. It's a really neat little program. It's a partnership with An Annapolis Immigration Network. We were having lots of unaccompanied immigrant youth coming in to the county. Some of them were perfectly capable of becoming legal, hardworking residents, but the way they arrived, and we could talk for the rest of the day about the way immigration is being handled, made it very difficult to help them. So we created this program with the notion we were going to try to serve 100 immigrant youth. There are two piece to it, pieces to it. There's a legal piece where AIGAN, which is the small not-for-profit run by Suzanne Martin, she works directly with attorneys and they manage a reduced rate to get those children's status in the country. We do the other piece, which is both the basic needs, family reunification, finding that youth housing as we need to. So it's this partnership between human services from the partnership and legal services from AIGN. We've had a fantastic first year. We have served, by March, we had served 35 children. So we were way over uh, what we expected to do by the end of June this year, and we are still serving those children. Believe it or not, those children would be between the ages of six and 17 and had come through convoys into the country. And so there's an accompany pro accompaniment program when they are that young to make sure that they get to family or wherever they need to go to be in a stable environment. We work closely with the school system. We are asking for a second year of that program, our initial ask was for three years. It was specifically to address some of the issues at the border created by the pandemic. Next slide, please. So we're also making an early childhood ask. And the reason we are doing that is because the zero to five population were probably more impacted by the pandemic than any other age group for children. They are coming into nursery school and into kindergarten lacking a whole set of skills, both socio-emotional and academic. Childcare is in um, a parlous state, both here and across the nation. So what we are intending to do, using the Early Childhood Coalition as a sort of kickoff place, is to build a county-wide network concentrated particularly on zero to five, five in the neighborhoods that need the most help where there is very little quality childcare, very little family childcare. We are going to track the funds that are coming available, but both at the federal and state level, make sure that Anne Arundel County is part of that and build a system and strategies to really address where the loss has been the most. So we're asking for a small amount of money to coordinate that effort. We've already started it in hopes that this will get funded. Remember, this is ARPA funding and it's it's really a good way to use ARPA funds with our smallest and most vulnerable, but with the notion that we're really going to drive down into our communities of hope where the need is most and really concentrate on how we address the learning loss that is the greatest and the trauma that is the greatest in, in our neighborhoods coming out of the pandemic. And next one please. And our last ARPA ask is a small one. We have a growing number of Hispanic residents in our county and, and I'm sure we could say that it's growing now on a daily basis. We do basic needs and we are very clever at both working with other agencies and figuring out where dollars lie to help specifically this community. And the reason why we, the partnership, 
are very focused on this on on the Hispanic popula population is because they are the population who are recovering least well. They, along with the African American community, most impacted in terms of health and economics, and recovering very slowly because the systems that they rely on, like the restaurant system and others, are also recovering slowly. We want to get these folk back to work. We want to get them back stable. Sometimes it's very hard to find the pockets of money that are available. So when we have exhausted all of the other pockets, we like to have a small fund we can go to when there is no other help available. So we're asking, we've had this fund in the past. It was extremely helpful. We are asking to have it again. It can be for anything. It could be electric bills, rent, medical bill, whatever. There are, there are so many variables in every family. But when you're an immigrant family, those variables increase, especially after the pandemic, multi, multi times. And so my staff are constantly coming up with new things where there is absolutely no way to pay for them. But it might be just a hundred dollars that make a difference for that family between being evicted and staying where they are. And that's what we use those funds for. And the, I, my slide on the budget has seemed to have gone. So I'm going to go to the next slide in the hope that it's there. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Now, where on earth did that go? How has it disappeared? There should be a slide that has the budget for what you give us, but I'm going to talk about it in the hopes that you'll forgive me. So last year, the council, and I'm, I was so happy, you gave us 360000 I think it was, as a small administrative, administrative amount to keep us going. And my slide showed you that we have used those dollars and we have leveraged those dollars to help us with our 3.5 million that we get from other uh, funding sources. We're not asking you to increase that. It's in the budget. We are delighted to have it. We're just asking you to improve it once more. We use it for administration and a tiny amount of fringe for positions that, that we can't fund anywhere else. So think of the 70,000 that we use for, for families that we can't figure out your money is the money where we cannot figure out. We do a whole load of, of what you think of as administrative tasks that are very useful to the county. I am part of many national foundations, um, work with both Brookings and the Aspen Institute to try to keep the county up with the latest thought on children and families, the latest thought on funding. We do an awful lot of grant writing. I write needs assessments. I plan for many agencies besides myself work closely with the hospitals, that little bit of funding keeps keep me and my agency going when we can't figure out another way to do it. So I'm sorry that that slide isn't there. I think you have it in your, in your actual books. I hope so. I want to thank you for all the work that you do. I know that your constituent services ring off the hook like ours do, and know that we are always there to be helpful to you, as well as to all of the families and children that we serve every day. Thank you for your service. It has been a tough year again. I think things are starting to look a bit better, but the families and children that we serve who are the most vulnerable, I'm just telling you, they are recovering slowly and they need all of us to be the best they can be. We have horrible, as you all know, horrible price increases at the moment. We have high rents. We, we are losing rentals because it's easier to sell your house. All, I talk to those families every day. I've just, just left a family and I won't go into the details, but it is getting harder and harder to think through how to be helpful to them. Our, our only aim as a partnership is to keep all our families uh, as, as the best they can be. And children cannot be okay if their families are not okay. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. I am sure that you're almost numb hearing all of this information this morning. It makes me sort of glad because I'm the last one and, and maybe you're too tired to ask too many difficult questions. Thanks very much. Well, I already see a hand. So um, <laughs> Miss Lacey, you may have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, I, uh, Lacey, how are you? 
I'm doing well. And Dr. Brown, I have no difficult questions to pose. I actually uh, just want to thank you for all the work that you and your team are doing and have done. Um, we recognize that the past few years have been extremely difficult. And I think, you know, any county agency that wants to uh, learn a little more about being scrappy and uh, inflexible and really using every last resource in a creative way can look to your agency, for an example. Um, and I'm very proud of that. I do have a question. It's just not hard. How much <laughs> money would you like to have? <laughs> I'm sorry? How much more money would you like to have in your for your operating costs? Well, now, as <laughs> a woman lacy. <laughs> Obviously, it would be wonderful to have more money. It is, it's very hard. It, <laughs> I wish you knew how we put this all together and how many times we have to rearrange the, the deck chairs. So one day we would like to get up to 500,000. How about that? That doesn't sound unreasonable at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Any additional questions? Well, Dr. Brown, um, I I will just say thank you again for all of the work that you do on, on behalf of all of our constituents. Um, your work has um, literally saved lives in the last few years. So um, thank you for undertaking undertaking all the things that you do and, and being scrappy and um, probably and, and bringing that scrappiness to um, you know, uh, spreading that scrappiness around the county. So, um, cause we all have to, we all have to do it to, to make good things happen. So um, thank you very much. And um, with that, we'll, we'll be in touch if there are any questions we're not thinking of right now. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for your service. All right. And at this time, is there any business, any other business to be brought before the council? Seeing none, may I have a motion to adjourn? So Thank you so much. Second, Allison Pickard. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. The County Council is adjourned until Monday, May 16th, 2022 at 7 p.m. when we will meet for a regular Legislative Council meeting in the Council Chambers. Please continue to check the county website for important information and updates. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you later. Bye.